rose again from the dead, that we also believe that he'll, those that, that sleep in Christ, will he'll, he bring with him. The day is coming when in the obsolete places, places for obsolete items, that's known as cemeteries, we call them hallowed grounds, but most people don't like to go to them. But when you go there, the day will come that that place for obsolete items will be emptied out. The scripture says that when Jesus returns, he will come with ten thousands of his saints. And they, outside of their physical body, but in their spiritual body, look, looks just like this one. <laughs> when you're in heaven, <clears throat> and when you're in the realm of the Spirit, it's just as solid as this one. Because you realize the realm of the Spirit is more real than this realm that we're in. This realm right here is, it's limited, it's temporal, it's soft by comparison to the realm of the Spirit. Now, you can't tell it, but did you know that the molecules inside this pulpit and that chair right there, the molecules are constantly moving? And with every day, they deteriorate. If you don't think so, let it sit there long enough. One day, it will go away. It will. This is what the physical is. It's a temporary place. But spiritual things never go away. They're there forever. That's why it's more real to be in the spirit than it is to be in the, in the, spirit, in the natural. But the people that come back with Jesus when he returns will go right to their cemetery and get their body and resurrect their flesh. Their spirit is that strong. That's a talented person that can go get his own body up and yank it out of the ground and be in it. That's what the scripture says. They'll come out of the ground. The, they'll, then it's not like they'll float out of the ground like a ghost, like you've seen depicted. No, they'll actually turn the ground up and their casket will fly open and they'll crawl out of it and shake dirt off of them. Why is that? Can anybody tell me why that is going to happen? Here's the reason. So that everything that Adam and Satan together in the garden communed and did together will be completely done away with. There will be no remembrance of any of the union between Adam and the devil. It's completely to undo everything that has been done wrong. Scripture says that, <clears throat> that uh, then when that day happens, then will be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. I don't like funerals. I preach them. I've been told we preach a pretty good funeral. Biggest, I really like preaching funerals better than weddings. Now, I love a good wedding. I do. I like funerals better than weddings because when you preach them, they stay that way. About 50% of the time, the folks you marry don't stay married. So everything is just almost 50% in vain. Now we got some folks who are going to be getting married soon, and I'm declaring right now that they're going to stay that way. Amen. In Jesus' name. Don't you agree to that? Amen. My words are powerful. I don't want you trying one another on like a pair of socks. But you know, like we're doing this, the marriage uh, on the rock and uh, uh, Wednesday nights. And I tell you, Jimmy Evans really is. He's, he is. he's the best I've heard. That's why I tell every young couple, for a $100 bill, you can buy his DVD set. And that's something you keep at home and refer to it because the, 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 uh, the principles are timeless. The laws never change. And you, and you know how long your mind will stay renewed to laws and principles? About as long as your hair stays combed. So you need to plug that DVD in once in a while and just watch it and remember, oh yeah, I forgot I knew that. The laws of marriage, the laws of priority, the laws of, of uh, see, I've already need my hair combed again. <clears throat> the laws of pursuit. You married him because he pursued you and as soon as he conquered you, he quit chasing you. Come on, play that Merle Haggard song. Let's chase each other around the room tonight. Let's play the game we played on our wedding night. To lock and bolt the door is only right. 
Hey, I'm your pastor, okay? I'm not somebody else. <laughs> Let's chase each other around the room tonight. Keep the love fires burning. Keep them going. Don't let it go out and try to, try to revive it. Just keep throwing wood on it. Keep it burning. Keep it going. I'll tell you, anything that, anything that you feed will grow. Relationships are like that. You feed a relationship, it'll grow. You starve it, it'll die. Everything's like that. So I tell young couples, I listen. I've been married 35 years, but I'm not an expert in marriage. I am not. If you don't believe me, you ask Janie. She'll tell you, I'm not an expert in marriage. <laughs> but I know people that are, and i just like to refer you to the, to the marriage uh, experts. See, I'm a general practitioner, and I'll refer you to the specialist. See? I can give you some of my, my own counsel, and we're going to do some of that here pretty soon, aren't we? Some counsel. And uh, I like my counsel. It's pretty simple. Marriage counseling is this simple. I'll ask them, are y'all, both of your parents still living? Okay. Both, they're still married? Okay. If they are, all right. What did, your, did your parents ever do anything? I'll look at him. Did your parents ever do anything that you didn't like with regard to their marriage? Oh, yeah. Okay. Did, did your parents ever do anything that you did like regard, regarding their marriage? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, the part that you didn't like, don't do that. The part that, they, that you do like, do that. And then I'll ask her, your parents still married? Okay, did they ever do anything that you didn't like? Didn't I do that with y'all? I mean, this is my son, and I ask him, did we displayed our marriage or the lack thereof in front of you? What did you see that you didn't like? Don't tell me, but did you see something that you didn't like? <laughs> well, don't do that. You see something you did like? Do that. Very simple. I'll ask you simple questions. Who's going to work? Where are you going to live? Who's paying the rent? Who's buying the groceries? Who's paying the utilities? Do you know what the, your budget is? What's your budget going to be? How much money are you making? How much money are you spending? It's a matter of addition and subtraction. If you make less than you're spending, that marriage won't last. Somebody's going to move back in with one of them's mama. And now here's another thing that I tell people. When you get in a tiff with each other, and you will. We've never had a crossword in 70 years. You are a liar. When you get in a tiff with your, with your couple, with, with, your, with your partner, with your husband, with your wife. When you get in a tiff, let me, let me qualify that. When you get in a fight with your spouse, husband or wife. Don't run. The, tip, the typical tendency is to run to your parent and tell them what he did, what she did. Don't do that. Because what will happen is inevitably you'll fill your parent full of a poison about this other person that they're already still having trouble deciding whether or not they wanted you to marry anyway. And then the two of you are going to make up and everything's going to be fine and you're going to forget what happened, but parents are going to remember. And now you've fed them something they can feed back at you to... to cause you problems in your marriage. Very simple. It, aren't these simple questions? Keep your problems at home. Work out your problems at home. You can't work them out separate. Get back together. Work them out at home. Deal with it. Dwell with them, Paul said, according to knowledge. Did you know that if I wasn't married to Janie and I was married to you? Can you imagine that? No, I can't imagine that. <laughs> But if I, I know it, you've got the perfect one. But if I wasn't married to her and I was married to you, you know I'd have to start all over and retrain you. You'd have to train me too, wouldn't you? <laughs> See, I'd find out, people that have been married, divorced, and married again, find out, they start telling their new wife, well, you know, Matilda didn't act the way you're acting when I did this. But you ain't married to Matilda. See, because dwell with them according to knowledge means whatever makes them mad, don't do that. If the other one didn't get mad at that, this one might get mad at it. If the other one got, was happy about it, this one might not be happy. She didn't mind that I went bowling every Tuesday night. Well, I don't want you going bowling every Tuesday night. Go bowling every once every six months. I think I married the devil. <laughs> See, conflict, conflict management, all these kinds of things. I had a girl one time ask me, I can't believe we're on this, but you'll bear with me. Asked me one time, what do you think about me dating your nephew? 
my nephew. She thought it was great that she was dating my nephew because dating the pastor's nephew. Hey, listen, just because the pastor has DNA in other family members doesn't mean it's, a, it's no great thing that you're dating somebody or marrying somebody that's kin to the pastor. Because you're going to be marrying that person, not the pastor. And I said, I said, well, you know, I'm not going to answer you according to whether or not he's kin to me or not. I'm asking you this question. Can he buy a trunk load of groceries? Oh, he can't? Okay. What about a place to live? He don't have a place to live yet? Okay. What about his job? Hmm. He's trying to get a job? Okay. Eh, eh, eh. I mean, my, my BS meter goes off right now. It, yeah. I, said, I would tell you right now, if he were not kin to me, I'd tell you the same thing. Do not marry him. He can't feed you. He, he's looking for a warm place to lay down. His mama's already kicked him out of the house. What do you want to do? What do you want to marry him for? <clears throat> he found out I said that to her. He got mad at me. I don't care. <clears throat> I love him. I do. But he needs a job. And I wouldn't put him on nobody. I wouldn't put him on the devil. I wouldn't tell the devil to marry him. He ain't mature yet. I believe in marrying a Christian. I do. But just because you're a Christian don't mean you got sense enough to come in out of the rain. I know some real dumb Christians, don't you? See, I know a lot of people have got a lot of brains but no sense. And it don't take long before you dig around and find out where the sense is or, where, or the lack thereof. It don't take long. How, how, many good, how many chances at a good start do you get? You get one chance at a good start. So you need a job. You need some clothes. You need some groceries. You need, you need a place to be. You need some regularity. You need some income. You need, um, you need less outgo than you got income. <clears throat> These are just basic fundamental things that, that are natural. Much of the problems in marriage are natural. They're not spiritual. Well, you know, I think our problem was that he was raised Methodist and I was raised Catholic. That can be a problem, but I've seen Catholics fall in love with Methodists and vice versa, versa and I've seen uh, people really make do. You know what? I'd, if I was a Methodist and, and my wife was Catholic, she'd be just real pleased with me if I could just bring home a paycheck. She would. She would. Isn't it amazing how just a little bit of provision can affect the, the, the uh, disposition so easily? That's just a little sound bite for you. But I'm looking forward to the upcoming weddings that we're going to be doing here and some kids that are planning, decided that each other are the plan of God for each other, and I like that. And, and who am I to judge that? Now, there are some people I have told, don't walk, honey, run. I have some people I've said that to. But others, and some I've had a few, not many, but a few that have proved me wrong. Anyway, what's the best thing about marriage? Fellowship with one another. Somebody that thinks like you. Did you know that Eve was Adam's DNA? If they'd had DNA profiling, they'd have looked exactly alike. One would have just been an X, another one would have been a Y or something. Yeah. yeah. But they'd have had the same DNA. But they thought alike. They had the same interests, the same desires, same plans, same hopes. We were driving to church a couple weeks ago and not say anything, just driving along. Janie was eating something. She likes a little snack on the way to church because she gets hungry before we get out. Oh no, Mildred, he's going to go too long. I'm, I'm hungry now. <laughs> We're driving along. And I'm, I'm just thinking about the service and thinking about what I'm, what's flowing around in me, what I'm going to say in, in the pulpit Sunday morning. And, and I heard her go, crunch and she reached over and this we went up to the apple festival up in Blairsville this thing looked like a softball big bite and she said you want to bite of this and I looked and I said 
Last time a woman did that to her husband, the whole world come unraveled. I said, Are you trying to tempt me? No. That's what Adam should have said. No. Just thought I'd pass that along. You know, if he had just said no. If he had just said no. No, he stood right there and did whatever you want to do, baby. You know, guys that just do whatever you want to do, baby. Like a zombie. Can't, I, ain't got a, I ain't got a brain of my own. Whatever you want, baby. I can't even think unless you tell me what to do, baby. Oh, you mean get up out of the bed? Okay. What next, honey? You know, Forrest Gump. Run! Okay. I've seen guys that don't have sense enough to get in and out of the rain unless she says, come in out of the rain. Okay, I'll come in out of the rain. I've seen it. I, have, I mean, believe me, that is a frustrated wife. But when you let your brain turn to jelly because you're afraid your thoughts and your original ideas might make her mad, believe me, she's going to get mad. There's a reason why Paul said, Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter against them. He put that line in the Bible for the generations to come. Love your wives and don't get bitter. There's a reason why, why women get bitter, why a men, man will get bitter because a wife will act a certain way that will make a man bitter. These are the things I have to teach young couples. Well, you just don't know, Pastor. Wait a minute. Now, listen now. I'm fixing to walk out here. I don't care if it is 11.30. You just don't know the husband I'm married to. He don't need to get better at me. If you just would be in my house five minutes, you'd understand. Yes, I would. But you know, there's no such thing as negative... Uh, uh, what's it called? Where, negative affirmation. You can't affirm somebody negatively. You can't shame him into doing right. You can't verbally abuse her into getting the house cleaned. We're going to get off this in a minute. I just don't know when. <laughs> a gentleman that can speak softly, speak sweetly, and place his words like apples of gold. First of all, set the atmosphere of the house like a setting of silver. And then dad's words are like apples of gold, sweet and good. There's just nothing like grabbing one around the head and neck and love on them a little bit and tell them how proud you are of them. There ain't nothing like it. Took me enough years to learn that. We tend to wound each other until we get old enough to quit wounding each other. But by the time we're old enough to quit wounding each other, we're carrying the wounds from the time we didn't know how to not wound each other. What does the Bible say that words are? Like swords. We need to learn to turn our swords into marshmallows and be sweet with each other. Gentle with each other. Did you know you're going to... You rem, all, those of you that have parents that have passed on, let me see your hands. Your parents have passed on. Okay. You know what you remember your parents for? Not the money they left you. Not the... <clears throat> the gift they gave you over the Christmas that you remember the words they spoke to you and you remember the words that they didn't speak to you. That's what you remember. So knowing that you're leaving a legacy of words in the hearts of your children, be careful. The old, um, the old patriarchs, before they, they passed on, they knew it was getting time, their last days of their, um, the sunset of their life would bring their kids in and speak blessings over them. Abraham did that. Isaac, Jacob did it. All of them. All the, the, the fathers of our faith spoke. The patriarchs spoke over their kids and told them, spoke blessings over them, and they received their blessings. And, their, and whatever the dad said, that's what came to pass in their life. Those are things to learn. And you learn it on day one of your marriage, of your, of your wedding, before you... Um, you've heard me tell you this before. I usually use it at, at about every wedding. But especially where there's someone that's being married again. 
See, I'm not one of those that believes that if you've been married one time and you've divorced, you, you know, you're just, you need to go to the island of misfit toys because you're of no good to society ever again. We're on the island of misfit toys. I'm a Charlie in the box. I've been married before. I'm no good for the church or the world. I guess I'm just going to have to be in the, until Santa comes back next year. Maybe next year. Be, so there's a lot of people, a lot of divorced people that are left wounded more by the pulpits than by the person that they divorced. That's not the meaning. That's not the purpose of the pulpit. I don't think you ought to jump in and out of marriages like underwear. But I do think it's not good for a man to be alone. Now, if you've got this proper gift, one after one manner and one after another, that's fine. But if it's not good for a man to be alone, how much more is it not good for a woman to be alone? Now, I'm not just speaking out of a sense of romantics. I'm telling you, I've seen some people, their second husband was their knight in shining armor. And I've seen some men who their, their, their subsequent wife was the best thing that ever happened to them. But we can determine that, yes, amen. But we can determine that in time. You just don't get in a hurry. I've seen... I've seen horror stories and I've seen fairy tale stories. It's what it seemed like out of, out of Prince Charming. I've seen both. But I, you've heard me tell you this before. Reagan married a woman that was beautiful. He was young. He was in his 20s. Married her and they were the star and the starlet. All of Hollywood was just, I mean, they were on every magazine. And uh, she didn't like some things he began to do because he was following his political track. He, he knew that he had a calling, but he didn't know what it was, so he became the president of the Screen Actors Guild. And he was political in, in his way of thinking. And she said, I didn't marry a politician. I'm, I want to be married to, a, to, a, to an actor because I'm an actress. And she began to shoot at him things about his weaknesses. And finally, one day she said to him, you know, you're always going to have a place here in Hollywood. Jack Warner wants to adopt you as his own son. But she said, you know, you just don't possess that special something that it takes to be a class A actor. And so for that reason, you'll only do B movies. You just don't have it. Well, later, when she saw he was going to go ahead and follow this, he, she wasn't, he wasn't going to obey her and get out of politics. I tell you, obedient husbands bother me. I'm not saying you ought not be your servant to your wife. I'm saying when you're, well, I'll get off that. <laughs> but when he, when, see, when God speaks to you to do something, you're much more motivated to do it. If your wife will get in line with your call on your life, you'll be surprised. That'll be a match made in heaven quickly. She finally packed up and left. She said, I told you I was not married to a politician. I'm out of here. It took him three years to get over it. He, she never changed her mind. Three years. And it wasn't because he didn't have anybody that loved him. He just didn't have anybody he could love. Finally, he met Nancy Davis. And on their first date, she was so taken back. She said in her memoir, she said she was so taken back at their first conversation with each other. She said, I couldn't hardly breathe. She said, I didn't think it was possible. I thought it was just a, a love story that gone. Somebody by pen and and paper wrote that he took my breath away. I thought that was just a saying. She said, literally, I had trouble getting my breath to come back into my lungs. He pulled it out of me. And she said, finally, when I caught my breath, she said, I was so taken back by his knowledge of the political process. She said, my God, Ronald Reagan, you could be the president of the United States. She told him that in 1949. Isn't it interesting that 31 years later, January the 20th, 1981, he was inaugurated our 40th president. What I'm saying to you is that he could not live above, he could not attain above the low confession of his first wife. He could not live beneath the confession of his second wife. Isn't it interesting that his first wife called him a second, but his second wife called him a first? <laughs> I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, Words are powerful if you never have the house on the hill, if you never have the extra little house that looks down on the water, if you never have the new vehicle, 
if you never have the best of clothes, if you never have the, if you never go and hobnob with the, the greatest of society, if your life is the simplest, simple life it can be, if you can just manage your debt and manage your, and speak sweetly one to another and love each other, you will be of all people most blessed. And your life will be like, there'll be music every morning and music every evening. It's the simple things in life that make you happy. I heard Dr. Norval Hayes say to me one time, he says, you know, Brother John, it's just the funniest thing to me watching these young couples that come to me. He said, uh, and I've seen a man come in and told his wife, I got, some, I got a surprise out here for you. And walked out and there's a brand new car and there's a bow on it. And she says, oh, that's nice. That was my favorite color. That's nice. But he said, but on her birthday, buy her some roses. She'll squeal and hug you around the neck. It's consideration. You girls write this in your notes. You have, a, you have a buzzword that is yours that you want him to always know. It's called consideration. If he called me on his way home to see, did we have enough milk? He thought of me. So I was thinking I was going to have to go to the store and he's going to pick it up on the way home. Isn't he wonderful? I've had girls say to me, he just thought about me. He just thought about me. Consideration. Knowing that you're thinking about her will put music in her heart. It's the simple things. He's got one, two girls. Write this in your notes. He needs a word. And it ain't sex. Some guy said, speak for yourself. <laughs> now I'm telling you, it ain't sex. He's got a word. Close to consideration. It's called admiration. If he knows you admire him, and if you let him, you girls are smart enough, let him just in earshot of you hear you talk about him to other people about how smart he is and what he did. You can believe what he did the other day. He fixed something. I couldn't believe it. I thought I was going to have to call the appliance, man. He, he had that thing fixed so fast. I couldn't. He can do anything. Music will play in him. He knows he's admired by the queen that he loves. It's just the simplest things. What's your word, girls? What's his word, girls? Uh-huh. We learned something today, didn't we? With that in mind, I'm going to just read a couple of scriptures and we're going to go from here. It's in 1 John in 1 Corinthians. We read this last week. And you're going to find out it's the same thing we, I just exhorted you on concerning marriage because these are just simple things. We knew that we called, last week we talked about how Psalm 42 says, deep calls unto deep. We talked about that, yes? Okay. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and then in 1 John chapter 1. 1 Corinthians, well, let me get turned there myself. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 9 says, God is faithful, by whom you were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Did you know that we are all called to an individual fellowship with God? And we all get together and we have a church fellowship, don't we? Isn't it a collective fellowship in the corporate body? We have that, don't we? But every person in here is called to an individual fellowship with God. Every one of us are. Now, 1 uh, John chapter 1 is a companion scripture. Verse 3 says, That which we've seen and heard and declare unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write unto you that your joy may be made full. There ain't nothing like a Christian that knows the joy that's in a Christian's heart that fellowships with God regularly. I can tell you in five, five, 30 seconds, I can tell you in the presence of a Christian whether or not they've got any regular fellowship time with God or not. If you're just never happy, believe me. You're not in the presence of God. You get in His presence, there's a bubbling joy that will come out of you. you don't, things don't even have to be going right. You, don't, you can be behind on your bills. Regular fellowship with God, and there will be just something that just keeps you joyful because you know that no matter what, I'm coming out of it. There's a regular fellowship that with only... There's a scripture that says, 
I know from whence cometh my help and my strength. It comes from above. Spending a little time. It doesn't take long either. One little word from Him will fill you so full of joy you can't get over it for three months. One. Regular fellowship with Him will turn you into a joyful... I've had people get mad at me. Why are you so happy? <laughs> well, I'm not always, for your information, but I'm learning. Fellowship with the Father cultivates our fellowship with each other. God redeemed us for the purpose of having fellowship with us. That's the whole reason He wanted to have fellowship with a family, and it's why He created us in His class. Did you know, I've got, I used to have animals. I haven't had any in a few years. But I love it. I've always been an animal lover. But you can't fellowship with an animal like you can with a fellow human being because they're not in the God class. Now, I said this to you last week. Regular fellowship with the Father is the womb and the mother of faith. Your faith, people that are in fellowship with God, just easy to believe Him. Easy. Because faith comes by hearing. And where does that hearing take place? In fellowship time with God, you'll hear from Him. He'll speak His Scripture to you. There's where the, fellowship, that's, that, there's where the faith comes from. If you've got a relationship with God but without fellowship, it's like a marriage without love. You've got a relationship, but there's no fellowship, and there's only struggle. It's struggling to be in a relationship with no fellowship. It's always a struggle, a struggle, a struggle. But as soon as fellowship is introduced to the relationship, suddenly the struggle goes away. Isn't it amazing? Now, we talked about this last week, how that Psalm 23 is a portrait of the rest of God that comes from fellowship. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. You know, it doesn't say in Psalm 23 that the, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He teaches me all I need to know by my iPhone 6. He doesn't say that. He just said, he'll, he'll, he'll have you turn that thing off and sit down and spend time with Him and you'll be surprised. Wait, you wait for the news to tell you what's happening? Wait till you spend some time with God and you find out some news before it happens. Oh my goodness, that's when you find out you've got intelligence coming from headquarters. That comes from fellowship. Nothing that happens surprises Him. And you get to do some fellowshipping with him, you'll find out nothing that happens is going to be surprising to you either. Now, um, deep in the heart of a man, he, he calls on the heart of God for fellowship with him. Deep inside the heart of a man, a man will call on fellowship with God. Down inside him, you, there's something in you that wants to talk to your father. And that heart fellowship extends to the members of the body. Fellowship has to be exercised on purpose. Put Acts chapter 11 and verse 23 on the board. Acts chapter 11, verse 23. This is where we, we tend to miss this. It says that when he came and had seen the grace of God, they were, was glad and exhorted them all that this, with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Did you know that God is not going to... Once he's apprehended you, he's waiting on you then to develop that fellowship with purpose of heart you cleave to him. It's say, I'm going to do this on purpose. Did you, did you know that um, Amos 3.3 3 says that except two be agreed, they cannot walk together. When two people are not in agreement, that's probably why we're exhorting about marriage this morning. When two people are not in agreement, there are two pathways because it takes agreement to walk together. Now, that's why Jesus said in Matthew 18, 19, He said, If any two of you on earth will agree as touching anything they ask, it will be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. You know why the devil fights marriages so much? Because it looks like God in the church, number one. And secondly, he knows that if he can get you from agreeing with your spouse, he cuts the power. When two people married can agree on things, man, the power takes off. And prosperity is the result. And blessing is the result. There's just nothing like agreement. Now, love, prayer, and carefully placed words will draw a person into close communion with you. I want to tell you something about fellowship, and then we'll close up here today. I have gotten close to people before that I pastored. And not necessarily close in the natural. Not in close in talk. I don't necessarily talk to them all the time or spend a lot of physical time with them. But I can tell the people that are close to me. You know who I know is close to me? That I know for a fact is close to me? 
people that pray for me. I can walk into the presence of a person that, I, that prays for me and I'll know it immediately. I know it like I know my name. Because there's a warmth between us. When you pray for how many times have you ever been talking about somebody and speak sweet things about people and then they call on the telephone? Isn't that, how often does that happen? I can just have somebody on my mind and think, and then sometimes I'll have that person on my mind. Now this is, I'm talking about heart fellowship, not just we went together and went, went to Cracker Barrel and ate. I'm talking about the heart motivated fellowship. We've got about seven, eight minutes here, and I want, I want to just exhort you about this. And I want you to observe this and become cognizant of it and begin to exercise it because it makes all the difference in, your, in the world in your life. <clears throat> I have seen times when the person will get on my mind and I'll be thinking about them. And I'll just pick up the phone and call them. Pastor, that is the craziest thing. I was just praying for you. How often has that happened? Those of you that have done that with me, raise your hand. Let me see. See, I was just, I was just praying for you this morning. We were praying, praying for you this morning. It draws people in. I've had people that I have known years ago that I've not seen in years. I play in a men's uh, amateur baseball league, and there's a guy I played baseball with a few years ago. And I got him on my mind. He lives in uh, Virginia now. And I looked through an old cell phone I had, an old contact list, and found his number and called to see if by chance and he was still had the same number. And he had me in his contact list. He hit the button. He said, John Alexander. I said, yes, sir. He said, man, it's the craziest thing. I was just talking about you with my wife this morning. And we mentioned you again this afternoon when I called her from work. And you called today. I said, yeah. I said, because I was, I, was talk, I was talking about you. I was thinking about you. Watch who you talk about. They know it. Because you realize that there is a more close proximity in the realm of the Spirit than there is in the physical. You can be standing right next to somebody and be a million miles away in the Spirit. And you can be not even in the same country with somebody that you love and they'll Skype you from another country. I've had it happen. I was thinking about old Monty Burke recently. Monty was the former pilot for Jesse Duplantis. Flew his small jet across the country in different meetings. Had flown for Brother Copeland. Was a left seat front pilot for Lester Sumrall years ago. He was the, he was the youngest, he was the youngest captain with United Airlines. It was a hard and fast rule with United Airlines that you cannot be a, a captain until you are 50 years old. And then you can only be a captain for seven years because it is an absolute mandatory retirement age, 57, for a captain. Safety. And he said they, they put him in the captain's seat when he was 35. His dad had been a pilot with a Pan Am and trained his son, and I mean, he was by the book. And he told me stories of times that he'd flown with uh, Lester Summerall and where they'd gone and things that they did. You know, you hang around people like that, their anointing transfers to you. And I was just talking about him one day, and he called me from, from um, Heathrow Airport. Pastor John. I said, Monty? Yeah! And he's got this childish laugh. <laughs> I just think about you. I'm sitting here in Heathrow Airport, getting ready to board the 777 in just a minute. He said, they're going to call me in for the run-up check. He said, but I just had to call you, brother. I said, it's the weirdest thing, Monty. I was just talking about you this morning. We see, when you talk about people that you haven't talked to, you, you try it. Try it. Find somebody you know you love and you'd love to hear from them again. And start talking about them and praying for them. Talk about them. Pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for them. That fellowship that's in the Spirit will draw that person to you. Now I'll tell you something I, I used to do, and I, I hadn't done this. I used to try it just to watch it work. Because it's very, somebody, I said this one time years ago to some students. And some students spoke up and said, you're talking witchcraft. And I said to the student, 
I said, no, I'm not talking witchcraft. Witchcraft took their craft from us. Witchcraft doesn't have this great thing that Christians need to try to copy. No. The devil has no new... He, he's, he's only a copier. He perverts, copies something and perverts it. <clears throat> I'll show you how this works. <clears throat> I had not seen Dr. Hayes since 1982, but once. And uh, I was called to Cleveland, Tennessee, and had not seen him in about five years. And he, seeing so many people back then, in the late 80s, he didn't even remember who I was. He, he was introduced to me, and I was, the, his driver invited me to sit in the back seat. And I sat down. And I knew what I was going to do. The dumbest thing you can do is, Brother Hayes, have you had some good meetings lately? Oh, what's been going on? What, have you, have you, how many people have been saved in your meetings? Some people can't shut up when they get around a man of God. That's not the thing to do. Somebody amen just what I said. I sat down. And I know I'm in the car with a general. He pulls out his newspaper. He's always, my driver, his driver told me later, he always reads the newspaper, and that means shut up, don't talk to me. He's got that newspaper out. And I was just sitting there looking at him. And I made myself on purpose think of the days that he said things that changed my life and how much I loved him, how much I appreciated what he'd done, and how the blessings that he'd been in the body of Christ and things that he'd taught me over the years that had been a blessing to me. I was looking at him just thinking, Thinking quietly, thinking, thinking. I was deep, calling unto deep. I called to him. He put his newspaper, uh, Brother John, uh, let me tell you something I did recently. And he started talking, and I looked in the rearview mirror, and Alan, his driver, looked at me and went, he said, this don't ever happen. And he started talking to me, I was listening, and I'm pulling on him, pulling on him. I'm not saying a word, just in my... In my belly, I'm pulling on him. Yes, sir. I'm listening. I'm looking right now. I'm listening. Pulling, pulling, pulling. He knew I was interested in what he had to say. And there was a strong fellowship between us. And when you're in the presence of a general and you're a foot soldier, guess who needs to be doing the talking? Some things the body of Christ don't ever learn, no matter how many times we tell them. I was listening to him, listening to him, and listening to him, and listening to him, and listening to him. And he started telling story after story after story after story. And then he sat down and he said, but, and then that story right there, I just told you, I hadn't told that, I, I hadn't told that story in 10 years. And I know what I'm doing. I know exactly what I'm doing. I cast a hook and I started reeling in the spirit, in, the, in my heart, my heart of love for him. Did you know the thing you love, you'll draw to you? Deep calleth unto deep. Deep, say it, deep calleth unto deep. Surface will call to surface too. If on the surface of my head I'm trying to tell you what happened in the latest football game and you're trying to tell me what happened in the latest football game, believe me, there's no fellowship except you're going to forget that score come next week. Football's got its place. I'm not against it. Or baseball. I'll play the game, okay? But I'm telling you, your heart can pull to the heart of another person. And it draws fellowship. A wife that will pray for her husband and love him and pray for him and is careful with her words will draw him into correct action. It will take place. It will. But you do it by the Spirit and not in the natural. Did you learn something today? Amen. We are called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us, cleanses, cleanses, clean, ongoing, of, from all sin. Cleanses us. Go to pulling on one another. Go to thinking about one another. Think about them. Think about them. Think about them.
think. And when you get in their presence, they'll know. They'll know. There'll be something. They'll know it even if they can't verbalize it, can't even say it with their own mouth. They don't know how to put it in words, but they'll know that you're close. Raise your right hand. This is a revelation of fellowship. See, now, like you, you two, you two right there. Y'all are close. Vicky and Tony are close. There's not a rift between them. They're close. Every time I'm around her, there's not 30 seconds goes by that the word Tony will come out of her mouth. I'm around him and, Vicky, Vicky, they say each other's name. They're close to each other. Close. Close because they think about each other. They pray one for another. They depend on one another. They, they're a couple. They're together. Y'all are the same way. Y'all are the same way. So what I'm saying is I'm calling a knitting together of fellowship between you and the person that you need to be close to. Might not even be your spouse. It might just need to be somebody that you, you can, a prayer partner, somebody that you can pray with. Your prayer partner starts gossiping, get you another prayer partner. Pray and start loving on one another. This is called loving in the Spirit. Intercession is a love in the Spirit. In Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us today for the Word Wise Christian broadcast here at Church on the Word. Remember, God sent us His written Word to get our thinking straightened out. When His mindset becomes our own, peace settles in, our believing and confession gets straightened out. That's when we get straightened out because we have just become Word Wise. God bless you. Go to YouTube and look us up. Y'all give him a hand. Good to have you. Mr. Alexander?